Happy Thursday, everybody, and welcome to episode 67 of the Snyder Cut. I am your unshowered host, Jeff Snyder, senior film reporter at Collider, and we have got a jam-packed show today. Last week's not jam-packed at all. Today, double the jam, double the packing, okay? Because everyone decided to just drop all their news this week. I mean, Monday, I don't even think I got up. I, I just stayed typing the entire Monday. There was just so many, so many news stories, one after another. Of course, the biggest story this week was the impeachment. Donald Trump, thank God, impeach him again. Get him out of here. I don't even want him to finish the term. Let's get him out before it's over. Like, uh, I, I, wow, what just craziness so, uh, over the last week without everything happening at the Capitol and like just, oh God, can this end? Can this end already right now? Uh, he is the first president to be impeached twice and to lose the popular vote twice, to be honest. Speaking of America, Captain America. That is the, the big story that just broke. My pal Justin Crow broke it about an hour, hour and a half ago. Chris Evans to return as Captain America. We don't know where, we don't know why, we don't know how or when, but it's going to happen. Are we excited about this? Are you guys excited about this? You must be, right? I'm not. I could give two shits, okay? This is why I didn't read comic books as a kid. Because, really, there's no stakes. Anything can happen. They can bring people back, kill them off, bring them back again, blah, 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 blah. Now, I know that Chris Evans was old in, in Avengers Endgame, right? So, you know, his next appearance, he could be, I don't know, uh, in the Captain Marvel sequel. It could be a flashback. It could be anything. Like, you know, he guy was, guy was around for a long time, Captain America. But I just don't understand why this is happening now. Like, like they couldn't even wait. Marvel could not wait two days or one day for WandaVision to come out. Like, I would have loved to have seen a Marvel movie or a Marvel TV show come out before they announced the return of Chris Evans. Instead, they couldn't even wait. So the last thing that came out was Avengers Endgame. Can't even wait for the next TV show or movie. We got to get Chris Evans back immediately. Now, like, why is this happening now? My pal Jamie, uh, uh, you know, texted me, and, and I thought he was kind of right on the money with this. Like, this is the kind of move that is supposed to happen five years from now, okay? So, like, was it the loss of Chadwick Boseman as, as Black Panther that, that instigated this? I just don't understand why, like, is, is Marvel nervous? Are they, like, afraid to fall back on, you know, well, we don't have Iron Man, and now Black Panther's gone, and we weren't planning on that, and, you know, we're not going to have Captain America. Like, were they just nervous that they were going to have to fall back on Ant-Man and Doctor Strange, and, and, like, that wasn't as strong? I mean, it's not like they're talking about doing another Captain America movie. So you're just talking about cramming the character into someone else's movie to what? Like satiate fans to, I, I just, I don't understand. I don't like, don't know why Chris Evans feels the need to, to revisit this character. Again, I don't know what the plan is. Maybe they pitched him some incredible plan like Lightyear where he just couldn't resist it. But uh, it's like, I know that the possibilities are endless, but like, isn't one of those possibilities just leave the character alone for a few years? How about that? Is it Disney thinking like, well, gee, if we don't have Chris Evans playing Captain America, then Chris Evans is going to go off and he's going to do the gray man uh, for Netflix. And we can't have that. You know, we can't have Netflix, uh, Chris Evans making money for Netflix and keeping the eyeballs on that service when he's our Captain America. Just fucking keep, keep him playing Captain America. I just... And I love that at least, you know, he's coming back for at least one Marvel property and the door's open for a second film too. Well, why not leave the door open for a third and a fourth film? If we're going to leave it open for a second one, like, I just can't stand this about comic book movies. I can't stand it. There's like, ugh. when there's no stakes, it just, none of it means anything. Were, were they afraid to give Anthony Mackie the shield, Cap shield? Like, is that it? Because I love how, like, the timing of this, all, it was like, 
it's all around, uh, you know, Anthony Mackie's all over social this week saying, well, I never said I was going to be Captain America, blah, 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 blah. You guys said that. You guys put those words in my mouth. I didn't say it. Like, every, it just screams like they're not, they're afraid to let Chris Evans go because they either don't have Chadwick or they don't have Downey anymore. And, and by the way, Downey's probably going to come back. I know, I love how we all are, you know, I just, we're mourning, oh, you know, Iron Man died and, and Captain America walked away. And it's just like, <sighs> you know that they're bringing back Iron Man. You know it. They can't help themselves. I'm, I'm going to tell you, there's going to be like a dozen stories in this episode where it's just all like people can't help themselves. I mean, it's the same thing with the Spider-Man 3 story that I wrote about Toby Maguire and Andrew Garfield coming back. Like, they're all coming back eventually. Stars just, they don't think like Jerry Seinfeld did in the 90s, where Jerry Seinfeld's like, you know what? I've created the best sitcom ever, and I'm going to go out on top, and I'm going to walk away, and I don't need to do scripted reunion specials like the Friends people. Or, or, or It's just like... Everyone's just so afraid of losing their fame and their power. And if you look at that deadline story closely, you can see the font change towards the bottom of the story. The fact that the font changes seems to indicate that something was copy and pasted. Uh, I just like, I really would love to one day be inside of an operation like a deadline. I mean, it's been years since I was inside of Variety, but I, I, I think... You know, that was an another chapter. Um, I just, I really would love to see how the sausage gets made a deadline. Are they digging these things up or is it just people just coming to them, handing them these things? Uh, very, very, very curious. Um, we got to talk about Army Hammer. And this may be a little controversial. Uh, Army Hammer, a bunch of DMs leaked some, some very uh, sexual things and, and, you know, people would call them weird things like he was talking about oh i want to hold your heart and i want to drink your blood i want to control when your heart beats i mean you know it, certain fetishes make people uncomfortable uh and anyways so there, there's like leaked dms and stuff between him and lovers even though he was married or whatever and uh but then i guess and i haven't read this stuff but one of my my coworkers, uh, you know indicated that sex workers have come forward with tales of, I don't know, abuse or maybe made them uncomfortable. I, I don't understand it. You can, you can tell by some of the commenters on Deadline, just like the language in those DMs, which have not been authenticated. We have no idea if they're real or not. I think that they're probably real. Uh, but like, you know, the language itself made people uncomfortable. Well, I am uh, very pro-sex, if... Uh, I hope that doesn't surprise anybody. Um, those, those who know me, I don't think it would. Uh, I, I don't really like what's happening here with with Army Hammer. He had to, so he had to drop out of Shotgun Wedding, the Jennifer Lopez movie, and he sort of cited the kids and said, "Well, you know, with all this going on, it would be terrible for me to just leave my kids for four months and go down to the Dominican Republic. So I'm pulling out, and Lionsgate is allowing me to break my contract." You know, maybe that was the case. Maybe Lionsgate was like, we can't have, you know, this sex scandal, sort you know, swirling around uh, the star of our family action movie or whatever. Or maybe it's Jennifer Lopez being like, I don't want to work with this weirdo who, who drinks people's blood or wants to drink people's blood. It's just like, it's so silly. It's just like, grow up. Army Hammer is a grown man who can do as he pleases. And... You know, clearly the other person on, on, on those DMs, like, they were into it. They were indulging. Like, that. we don't know the nature of their relationship or, or you know, maybe, I mean, I think Army Hammer is kind of clear. Like, this is a kinky guy. But you know what? It's not illegal to be kinky. It's just, it all goes, you know, it reminded me of the cannibal cop who we still call the cannibal cop, even though he hasn't eaten anybody. He's eaten as many people as I have, which is zero. 
you know, but he had these thoughts and he put it on a message board. He was fantasizing about eating his wife. And then he ended up losing his job, you know, in, in the NYPD. Now, some of that is because he was using, he was going on these websites and, and using the NYPD computer and, and but going on during work time and, and stuff like that, uh, which is not the job of an NYPD officer. I understand that. But if it's just like this guy, you know, has cannibal fantasies like that, that's not illegal. Okay, it's not illegal to fantasize anything and to, and to be prosecuting people for thought crimes, essentially, which is the title of that documentary. It's excellent. Track it down on HBO. It's probably on HBO Max. It's just a very, very slippery sl slope. And so I know I went on Twitter, you know, and I'm not on Twitter very often, but I, I couldn't help myself. I had to make a joke about, you know, Christopher Plummer coming in to replace Army Hammer, which is absurd. He's not going to play Jennifer Lopez's lover. Uh, you know, but I found this funny headline where it was like, Christopher Plummer has quit drinking. And, and so I made it, well, he, has he, has he quit drinking blood? That's all JLo cares about. Uh, couldn't help myself, but I also felt a little bad about it because I am pro army in this situation. Like army hammer, kinksters of the world unite. I, I got your back, dude. I, I mean, unless you are doing some shady shit. Uh, that, that women don't want you to be doing or sex workers don't want you to be doing. Like sex workers are people too. Just because you've paid them for their time doesn't mean you can, you know, uh, abuse them or, or do things that make them uncomfortable. But again, I haven't seen any of the, I haven't really gone all the way down the, the army hammer rabbit hole. All I saw were, you know, some DMs, which we don't know are, are real or not. And I thought the whole thing was kind of silly. It's like a tee hee kind of thing that gets everybody talking, but you see how that snowballs. And, and it ended up forcing Army to make a statement last night where he just called it all like bullshit and these vicious and spur spurious attacks on his character. And I mean, again, I don't know exactly what he is referring to there. If it's the DMs and the judgment that people had out of that or, or some of the, the sex worker stuff that I haven't really read up on. Uh, but I think Army Hammer is a good actor. I think he would have been good in that part. And I, I think it's a shame that he had to walk away from it. But again, if, if it's true that it's just, you know, family is his, is his priority at this moment, then you can't blame him. I mean, it's not like he's walking away from another social network opportunity. It's a fucking JLo, you know, action comedy. Not, 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 not a big deal in, in the larger scheme of things. Uh, Army also dropped out of Gaslit, but that was more to do with the fact that he's uh, doing that Godfather series for Paramount Plus called The Offer. Um, so that, that really wasn't part of this skink scandal, if you even want to call it that. Here's one that rankled me to the point where I had to leave a comment on Deadline. Uh, and, and I always comment under my own name. I'm, I, you know, people who hide behind anonymous comments, I think, are, are, are bullshit trash. Uh, but Russell T. Davies, who's the, you know, years and years guy who created this show, It's a Sin, he says it's important to cast gay actors in gay roles. But it's not, it's really not at all. What's important is hiring the most talented actor for the job. Now, you know, maybe that means hiring a gay person to play a gay character because they have lived that experience and they can relate to it better. But I, I mean, you should be able to hire gay people to play straight roles too. It should work both ways. Like, and if it's all about authenticity, Russell, right? If it's all about authenticity for you, then why don't you cast some HIV positive actor, actors to play HIV positive characters? I never hear that. I, I always hear, well, straight actors shouldn't be playing gay roles. Well, what about HIV negative people playing HIV positive people? They've never lived that experience. They don't know what it's like. I mean, if that's what you truly care about. And, and so I left this comment, I'll, I'll just read it right now. If Russell's so committed to authenticity, he should try casting HIV positive actors in his AIDS crisis series. Oh, wait, it's none of his business who has HIV, just like it's none of his business who is or isn't gay. I mean, think of like, is he not aware that there are hundreds, if not thousands of gay actors who remain closeted, right? Does that make them any less gay? Or does it make them any less appropriate for gay roles? Would someone with HIV who's straight be more appropriate to play a gay man with HIV or would a gay man without HIV be more appropriate for that role? Like when Russell has the answers to these questions, call me Russell, because I would love to talk to you about it. I really, really would. I think it's ridiculous what is happening in this town. Speaking of which, 
if you want to know, like, I love how this, this idea, this, this, this myth that Hollywood cares, trust me, Hollywood does not give a single solitary fuck, okay? If you want to know how callous Hollywood is and how the industry doesn't care for anyone other than itself, look at the news this week about production resuming, okay? So there, there's, there's, there's right and there's legal, okay? Just yesterday, I'm reading, uh, LA County reports 12,000 new cases, close to 300 deaths, and nearly 8,000 hospitalizations. SAG-AFTRA spokesperson. In light of this, it is hard to understand how an increase in production in this environment makes a lot of sense. Because all the, all the you know, shows and movies are going back into production. They took a break. They, they made a whole big to-do. We're taking a break for the sake of COVID in LA. That break was like 10 days. Not, it wasn't even like two weeks. Gabrielle Carteris, patients are dying in ambulances waiting for treatment because hospital ER rooms are overwhelmed. This is not a safe environment for in-person production right now. But SAG is letting it going ahead and happen, right? Can't piss off studios. That's where the money is. I'm, I, like this, I'm reading the article. The studio's decision to move forward with filming is sure to be controversial, but does it represent a blatant disregard for county health department directives? Phil LA spokesperson, Philip Sokolowski, the county's recommendation to pause does not take the form of an instruction. They have been given guidance that it would be an advantage to Los Angeles to pause for as long as possible. But I think that the county health department also understands there are business imperatives and other logistics that come into play their decision like this. The production pause, he explains, has been a re recommendation and a request. Why are we recommending and requesting things? Fucking shut this shit down. I can't go back to Los Angeles because the fucking place is the hot zone of the epidemic, the, the hot zone of the pandemic, right? And it's because Hollywood refuses to stop. We've got money to make. Forget all these people dying. Forget all these people get, be, getting sick. And, and don't tell me, you know, well, you know, it, it's not that many people on set who are, who are coming down with the virus or, or we haven't lost anybody, nobody's died. Like you are, you, you have no conception or idea how many, when you get all these people together inside a, a closed space, yeah, there's testing done and stuff like that. There's asymptomatic people, that, the, the tests don't even fucking work. Let me tell you that right now, that is 100% true. I know that for a fact, the, the tests, are bullshit. They're like 50% accurate. So, you know, you have an entire town going back to work as if everything's fine. And the situation is only snowballing, getting worse and worse and worse. And, and, and Hollywood and Los Angeles is not just movie making, like it's a city with millions of people. And yet this small part of it, maybe it's a large part of it, but this part of it doesn't care. We have shows to get out. We got to get a new episode of the Goldbergs out on Wednesday night. Get the production up and running. It's fucking ludicrous. Ludicrous. All right. Those were sort of the top stories, I believe. Yes. All right. Let's talk about some other shit. Oh, my God. I'm digging it. Um, let's talk about some fucking movies and some projects. Nicole Kidman. Nicole Kidman. Great actress. I actually think Nicole Kidman somehow is underrated as an actress. However, she has been cast as Lucille Ball in this Amazon project that Aaron Sorkin's been plotting for years called Being the Ricardos. It's a Lucy Ricky movie about their relationship. And, and so he got Nicole Kidman and Javier Bardem. He's been trying to get Javier, Javier Bardem in this movie for like three years or however long it's been around, trust me. If he had Kate Blanchett uh, attached to play Lucille Ball, for a long time. Uh, and I, I had known that she had departed this project within the last few months or whatever, and that they were trying to find somebody else. Um, so it was going to be Kate and Javier. Now it's Javier and Nicole Kidman. Forget the fact that these people are way too old for these roles. Nicole Kidman is just not someone you think of for playing like the greatest comedian of all time. Uh, comedian, you know, like, I just, yeah, she has the red hair and she is a great actress. Like, I mean, maybe she'll be, end up being very good. But my gut reaction to this is this is terrible. Like, this is 
awful casting. And I, I mean, I only saw one person excited about it. And that person is an executive producer on the project. Uh, this, this casting decision was met with just widespread derision as it should have been. I don't understand. I don't understand. It. Like Nicole Kidman, is she like a, a draw? Like, is it because she, so she did Big Little Lies and The Undoing and there's this air of prestige about her. Like, I, I probably could have found 10 actresses better for, for this role. I honestly think Kristen Wiig would have been better for this role. Um, Nicole Kidman, man, I, I, God bless her. Like, I, I think she is great. But Lucy, get the fuck out of here. Like, the, get out of here. And Aaron Sorkin, like, I would love to see this guy get back to, like, writing fictional movies. Like, I, a few good men may have had some elements of truth or been based on some real case or whatever, but, like, those were, you know, characters that he created. I don't want Aaron Sorkin to be stuck just retelling history. I don't need all of history filtered through the eyes of Aaron Sorkin. We've seen The Social Network and Steve Jobs and Molly's Game and Trial of Chicago 7 and just, like, all these, like, things. Like, get back to just move away from the, the true story thing, Aaron Sorkin. Give it a fucking break, would you? Would you do it for me? Thank you. This project I am pumped for. This sounded great. Uh, Darren Aronofsky, who hasn't been heard from in a while and was always up there for me with the Finchers and Paul Thomas Andersons of the world, uh, even though Mother was absolute trash, which was his last movie. Uh, Darren Aronofsky doing The Whale for A24 with Brendan Fraser. He's going to be playing like a 600 pound man. Uh, it's based on a play that kind of looked really interesting. Like I, I just, I love everything about it. I love Darren Aronofsky going to work for A24. I love Brendan Fraser booking a Darren Aronofsky movie. And I love Brendan Fraser sort of embracing his, his size because he's a big boy, you know, um, and, and getting this just opportunity to just, just like fucking act just act you know um yeah the whale sounds super interesting to me um I never would have seen that coming either brendan fraser as the lead at this point in his career as the lead in, Ar in an aronofsky movie um but that's why i dig it man like it's not like i love that aronofsky has now gone from like working with jennifer lawrence to working with brendan fraser because you know what it's going to help his art because I don't, I don't think, you know, I mean, he could say what he wants about Mother. I thought it was just god awful. Um, <laughs> but you know what? Those kinds of filmmakers, they, they, frankly, I think they, you have to forgive them that one terrible movie, right? Like Mank, I think Mank sucks. Uh, Inherent Vice, I think Inherent Vice sucks. Uh, but I think these these guys have to kind of get these movies out of their system. So uh, ho ho here's hoping that The Whale is a big comeback for both Darren and for Brendan Fraser. Ugh, ben Affleck signing on to direct The Keeper of the Lost Cities for Disney. Probably something he'll, he'll never actually make. Uh, I just don't look at Ben Affleck's taste and, and see a Disney director there. This is not, he's not the next John Favreau. Um, Elsie Fisher and Alan S. Kim from Minari playing the, the latchkey kids. Uh, that's kind of interesting. Uh, that, that, that could be an indie worth keeping an eye on. Uh, Sony. Yeah, Sony Pictures, which is still a movie studio, if you believe it or not. They bought a supernatural action spec from David Guggenheim that Simon Kinberg will produce. I'm sure this will be a mediocre movie that we will all forget the we get it comes out. That's just how Simon Kimberg things really are usually, right? Um, sorry. Uh, Amazon about to purchase the Chris Pratt movie, The Tomorrow War, for $200 million from Skydance. Is this where we are now? Where like, like if you're going to spend $200 million on a big package like this Amazon, why not just like make it yourself so you have some control over it? Or is it that much easier to just farm it out to people who make these kinds of movies on the regular, like Skydance, just let them do their thing and then we'll come in and we'll pay you whatever the movie costs plus, you know, 25%. If, but like, is a movie like that really going to turn a profit 
at, at the box office, like Chris Pratt outside of Jurassic World and, and Guardians of the Galaxy, like this guy hasn't proven he's a movie star. And now you're now we're, Amazon's paying two hundred million dollars for his new sci-fi movie, which sounds kind of fucking ridiculous. I don't understand these decisions. Like, if I was in the meeting at Amazon, everyone's all excited. We're going to get the new Chris Pratt movie. We're going to get the new Chris Pratt movie. Like, I'm, would I be the guy who everyone looks at? Like, I have two heads sitting there in the meeting who's like, do we really want to pay $200 million for this? Could that $200 million be better spent doing something else? I, I just, it, 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 it's beyond me. Uh, we're getting a John McCain movie. That sounds, I mean, the guy lived a fucking hell of a life. That sounds like it could be interesting. Uh, but, but, of course, casting, casting will be everything. We're getting a searching sequel. This one was kind of interesting. That uh, Sony Stage 6 label and, uh, and, and Anish Giganti and his producing partners, they tapped the editors of the original movie, uh, Will Merrick and Nick Johnson, to direct the sequel. It's going to have an all-new story and cast and characters and everything uh, which makes sense because i do think that you could this is like a good you don't need to do a straight sequel to that movie like it's just a good title uh for different you know screen life thrillers and mysteries um so i i think it's a smart thing to, to keep that franchise if you will going i mean it made 75 million dollars on a budget of less than a million um yeah, I, I would call it still searching or, you know, researching, searching again. Hopefully it's not just searching too, because you can come up with, with a word like searching, you can come up with a better title than that. Uh, I thought this was interesting. All the actors from Mosul are getting death threats from, from ISIS or ISIS supporters. That's kind of wild. Um, interesting that, that in that article on Deadline that uh, they did not have any ISIS references in the script from Mosul. They just replaced it with another random terrorist organization or whatever, and then just told the actors, hey, when you get to that line or whatever, just sub, sub in ISIS. Uh, but they didn't want the script sort of circulating. And, you know, I, I mean, I imagine they really had to like step up the security, not just for that production, but for now for, for the cast and crew afterwards, that they become targets. It's kind of, um, like, I wonder if, if those were all Hollywood movie actors, would they be getting the same death threats? Would we be hearing about those death threats? Or is it just because these actors maybe don't have their own personal protection team, you know, security teams or whatever, and so they're more vulnerable? Or you know, I, I don't know what it is, but I hope that the Russos are, are taking good care uh, of everybody, and I'm, I'm sure they're on top of things. Uh, cause that, that's got to be, you know, scary for, for an actor to deal with. <laughs> Netflix signed a gigantic mega deal with Kevin Hart. He's going to get the Adam Sandler treatment. He's going to do, uh, you know, some comedies there, four-picture deal. Um, I'm sure he may produce some others that maybe he's not necessarily in, much like, you know, Adam produces a David Spade movie occasionally, whatever. Kevin James movie. Um, I think this is the smart move. Uh, I mean, every studio kind of wanted to be in business with Kevin Hart for a time, but then all those projects have kind of cooled off. You don't hear much about a lot of them anymore, whether it's, you know, Night Wolf or, you know, that the universal project. Sorry. I was holding news of this, of a universal project with Kevin Hart and, and Chris Pratt called The Tree, where uh, Kevin Hart was going to be playing like a, a White House aide who's responsible for going to get the perfect Christmas tree for the White House. And so he goes to, you know, Bumblefuck, Minnesota or whatever, and, and uh, you know, meets a lumberjack, Chris Pratt, and they cut down this tree, but then they have to get it, you know, on a flatbed back to D.C. And it's just, I don't know, like that sounded funny, but you never, like that, that, that oh, it just went dead. All the Kevin Hart stuff kind of just like disappeared and, and Netflix has now been a home for him. Uh, I, I wonder if they will continue to be a home for for problematic actors you know who have said things that hurt people's feelings um i loved kevin hart's new special uh you know whatever it was called the you know don't zero fucks given whatever um so i i think he's found a good home there and uh i think this deal will be prosperous for both of them you know, it's going to give Kevin Hart the chance to do what he wants over there. I think I think people want comedies. Like, where are the fucking comedies? People want to laugh and feel good. And, and, and 
I just don't see many comedies being made, like actually funny movies, not like YA movies with some laughter, like The Kissing Booth or To All the Boys, you know, like. Anyways, Kevin Hart, more power to you, dude. The guy fucking works hard. People have opinions about him. They're entitled. I, I like the guy. I, you know, there, there's he may come off a bit spoiled or like a braggart at times, but like there's something authentic about that. You know, like when he, he in his stand up, and he's like, I, I think that my daughter's school underestimates the level of celebrity that I am. They want me to work as greeter. Like that, that echoes, that resonates with me because I can actually see that happening for some reason. Uh, David O. Russell and his mystery movie. We have no, we really have no idea what this fucking movie is about. I've heard it was about a doctor and a lawyer who teamed up. I don't even know who's playing the doctor, who's playing a lawyer. Who fucking knows? Uh, but anyways, it added Rami Malek and Zoe Saldana, two pretty solid actors. I mean, that's a great cast. Christian Bale, Margot Robbie, Rami Malek, Zoe Saldana, John David Washington. Like, and it's, and it's diverse. And uh, yeah, like, I, I can't wait to see what David O. Russell has up his sleeve. It is an out of the furnace reunion for Christian Bale and Zoe Saldana. I bet you don't remember that movie. Um, and yeah, Rami is the second Oscar winner to join that cast. Anna Paquin cast as Kurt Warner's wife, an American underdog. Uh, I'd heard Carrie C- Russell was going to get that role, but I, I always thought it was like, she, she seems bigger, you know, uh, too, too big for that part, for that movie. Um, so I went with Anna Paquin, you know, who is, you know, fine. She's a good, good actress, right? Um, Michael Pena filling in for Stanley Tucci in Moonfall. Uh, that's the Rowan Emmerich sci-fi movie. I mean, it seems like Michael Pena, this is like right in his wheelhouse of late with the that uh, alien invasion movie that I started watching and never finished. And it's just like, I don't know. I would love to see Michael Pena get a fucking movie, like a sound of metal that really shows what this guy can do. He is a great actor. And I don't know the last time like we all like turn to each other after a Michael Pena performance and like, wow, like, this guy's great. He's just like, I don't know. I don't know if he's picking the best projects. I mean, maybe he's just not being offered the best projects. Uh, but like, you know, I, I saw his work in Crash and it was like, this guy, he's capable of, of greatness. And, and I want someone to write that part for him. You know what I mean? Well, I guess he was, he was great on Narcos, but um, that, like that, that, he was great as Kiki. But like, there wasn't any like Emmy talk for him around that, was there? <laughs> Like he should be like one of our premier actors. I just don't think the Roland Emmerich movie is, is, is the way to get there. May Kalamawi. May Kalamawi from Rami. She has been cast as Oscar Isaac's love interest in Moon Knight, uh, which also brought on the, the synchronic directors, um, Benson and Moorhead. Uh, those guys made, you know, the endless, which I, I absolutely hated, but synchronic was much better um, so, so, you know, they're on, the, they're on the rise. I like their trajectory. This probably feels like the right fit for them. Um, and I wonder if they just got the job because, you know, uh, Oscar Isaac and Anthony Mackie, who's the star of Synchronic, share a manager. So I wonder if, if you know, uh, they, they put in a good word or, uh, you know, if, if the manager was just, you know, liked what he saw out of them on Synchronic and recommended them for the, the Moon Knight gig. Who knows? Um, what else, what else, what else? Netflix put out a huge, uh, you know, a sizzle reel for its 2021 uh, slate, which is remarkable. I mean, it has, they're going to be releasing a new movie every single week. I think they've announced like 71 movies and, and there was nothing new. I, you know, we'd known about all these 70 movies and I'm sure there were even movies that they have made or in the can or are in the process of making that like aren't even on that list. They'll either be added to it or they'll be held for 2022. But it, it, it was clear that like Netflix has come a long way from being the company that leaves a red envelope in your mailbox once a week. Like they have put together a really strong slate for a company with very little marquee IP. I think you just got you got to hand it to them. Like, and when you have stars like Leonardo DiCaprio and Jennifer Lawrence buying in for this Adam McKay movie, Don't Look Up, like that's sort of the last barrier. Can you get A-list movie stars on your service? They're going to have Leo. They're going to have The Rock this year. I mean, yeah, like it it, it has happened. Um, 
it was also announced uh this this leaked as part of this weird press release um regarding another project uh richard pa- uh, you know richard powers this thing bewilderment he got set up with brad pitt's company um but in the release it's like hey you know th- this book that that uh, powers wrote that won the pulitzer last year the overstory um is in the, in the works at netflix from benioff and weiss like that had never been reported so i picked up on that um what was it yeah, yeah, Netflix, right? And uh, so, yeah, I, I picked up on that. I reached out to Netflix for a comment, and they're just like, "Yeah, can't, can't confirm, can't comment. We'll, we'll, we'll post, we'll put you down as tracking. If I fucking hear put you down as tracking one more time, like this is just like, this is the fucking way that Hollywood thinks of journalism. Yeah, we'll add you to the list of journalists asking us about this project." And then they think that they've done their job and they think that they can collect a six figure salary for saying that. Like that's not, that doesn't make you a communications executive. Engage with the reporter. I mean, it's in the fucking release. There's no equivocation about it. Who? I don't care if you want to say something about it or not. Someone else has already said something. It's going up. It's just, it is remarkable to me who is made a communications executive or a publicist. It really just seems, I'm just going to say, it seems like a way to just hire women and minorities. Like, and I'm not saying that every woman or every minority that I deal with is a moron, but there are a lot of people these days working in communications and uh, publicity for these streamers, networks, studios that just have no idea what they are doing. They are actively bad at their jobs, and they certainly have no idea how to talk to a journalist like myself. Uh, Dexter and Succession added some folks, nobody terribly uh, noticeable. Um, The Lincoln Lawyer, I think Netflix picked that one up at a turnaround from CBS. It was gonna be a big CBS show. They got Logan Marshall Green to do it. Now they found a new hyphenated actor, Manuel Garcia Rulfo from uh, Six Underground. So, you know, the Netflix audience is already familiar with him. I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm into that. I'm into just something different. Um, so, sure. You know, if it's set in Los Angeles anyways, like, yeah, there are lawyers of color here or, or, you know, in L.A. I'm not here in L.A., but yeah, they're, it's a very diverse city. It's not just all white fucking attorneys. So, Nice to see uh, Manuel Garcia Rolfo get a get a big job like that, get get his own series. And uh, yeah, Lincoln Lawyer has its fans, man. I really like the McConaughey movie, and maybe I'll give this this TV show a shot if it's any good. Uh, Kyle Patrick Alvarez directing something for Disney Plus called Crater. Didn't really read too much up about that. He doesn't really strike me as a Disney Plus director, much like Ben Affleck doesn't. Um, but I am happy to see Kyle get a job because I do love his work on uh, the Stanford Prison Experiment. Zoe Deutsch signing on to do this project, The Hound. Like she, she read the script. It was on NYU's Purple List. I've seen this movie 10 times in the last few years. Like I, I don't understand it. I don't understand it. I can point to three movies about the same thing where a girl gets bitten by a dog and starts to turn into a dog, right? Bitch and... There's another one and I just, how many times can we see the same premise over and over? And how many times can, I mean, I, I, hey, I haven't read the script. I don't fucking know. Maybe it's great. Maybe it's a, a brand new take on everything. Uh, my boy, Bill Belichick, rejecting the presidential medal of freedom. Good for you, Bill. <laughs> Who needs that shit when you're getting handed it by Donald fucking Trump? R.I.P. to Jessica Campbell, the actress from Election and Freaks and Geeks. She played the uh, the, uh, the character who Seth Rogen was into, who had male and female sex organs, um, or was born with male and female sex organs, and then uh, lived as as a as a female. Um, that was a great episode of Freaks and Geeks. Like I know everybody's sort of talking about Election uh, as as they remember her, and she was quite good in that movie, but. Um, I thought that was a very, very tricky role on Freaks and Geeks, and, and she did a great job with that. So yeah, I know she kind of retired from the, the business in like 2002, but uh, yeah, she, she'll be missed. And um, only 38, too. Re- just terribly sad. We also lost director Michael Apted, who, who's known for his work on the 7-Up documentary series. Just a very versatile 
a filmmaker could kind of do a little bit of everything coal miner's daughter and um like he even did like uh you do one of those narnia movies um so yeah you know R R rip to to both of them um i saw the night stalker series i watched that last week and reviewed that this week for collider thought it was pretty good thought it was pretty good it, it, it was not what i was expecting i was expecting the richard ramirez series but the real like richard ramirez the name is not even mentioned until the end of the third episode so the only ramirez stuff you're getting is in episode four which i did think was the, the strongest of the episodes <laughs> Um, but yeah, a, a nice job by, by Tiller Russell, who also did the last narc last year uh, or yeah, last year on Amazon. Um, I also watched his movie Silk Road last night. I am embargoed, so I can't talk about Silk Road. Uh, but I do think that Tiller, his skill set may be a better fit for nonfiction. Um, but check out Night Stalker. For sure. Netflix also announced another crime series that I watched this week. I'm also embargoed on, and it's that uh, crime scene, crime scene, The Vanishing at the Cecil Hotel, which investigates the disappearance of Elisa Lamb, which was kind of a fascinating case that, that took uh, internet sleuths by storm. Um, I, I will have more to say to that as we get uh, about that, as we get closer to the release date in February. Um, do, 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 do. what else is there this week? Do, 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 do. Just going through the list, guys. Some industry stuff, you know, Daria Sursek and um, Mike Ireland were named co presidents of production at Paramount. Really like both of those executives. Uh, Paramount has a really strong executive team. I just, you know, let's see if they can actually make some movies and hang on to them. They just have been selling off everything that's not a Tom Cruise movie. Uh, Liz Raposo uh, added to the, um, she's going to run Michael B. Jordan's Outlier Society. I think that's a great hire. I'm surprised Michael B. Jordan hired a white person. Um, you know, uh, I, I thought Michael B. Jordan was all about, you know, give, giving more jobs to black executives and lifting up the, the community and all that. Um, he, he, you know, was working with Alana Mayo before. And then she took over like her own like label, I would think at, at MGM. Um, so yeah, I, I was surprised that Michael B. Jordan went with a, a, a white person, but you know what? Liz Raposo, regardless of the color of her skin, great executive, uh, you know, a lot of experience and working on big movies, the type of movies that Michael B. Jordan wants to be producing. Uh, and then finally, Tanya Cohen, uh, has joined range media partners. I met Tanya way back in the day. She was a young agent. I think she was either a Paradigm or Verve at the time, I forget which, but uh, they called her the Bulldog and, and that nickname has always stuck with me. Um, I, I think she is one of the, the best and brightest, uh, you know, who, who could be running this town 10, 20 years from now. Um, so congratulations to, to her. I love this, the, the, you know, whenever anything in the agency world happens, so you have to read the comment section on Deadline because they're great. Tanya is a well-liked uh, agent, so she got a lot of now now manager but a well-liked person in hollywood so she got a lot of good comments but then you know you, you always get the the people from the other agencies or, or whatever who are like you know range is still owned by that guy steve Cohen, whatever the fuck is his name is i don't even know i forget uh but he's like a big trump supporter a big trump donator too and so every time they're just like hey don't forget range partners run by a, a big trump uh supporter like I mean, I, I think they have a point. Like, I, I think if you have ties to this guy, we you either need to cut them or we need to cut you. Uh, but it, it's hard. Like, I, 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 you know, range is just going to represent like half the town. So I, you see all these executives coming out there, you know, saying this, well, put your money where your mouth is, like walk, walk away from this company or, you know, insist that the, uh, you know, the guy who owns the company walk away from Trump and the Republican Party, because otherwise it's just, it's just fucking words with no action behind it. People, man, they just don't, they're like afraid to, to take a stand. And when their money is on the line, they're afraid to take a stand. And what's funny is that these are multi-million dollar people who just never have to worry about money. And they still can't do it. I see people like me 
not not me, but like me, making the kind of money that I make, taking these kinds of stands all the time. And it's because they have principles, which are the first thing you have to fucking leave when you hit the city limits in Hollywood. Principles go out the window. Um, and, you know, you know, I read this story in, in THR this week, and it was about how, like, you know, Warner Media just scrambling to, to keep the talent happy and, and giving everybody these bonuses that, you know, they've been floating these new bonus structures with all the movies that are going to be debuting on HBO Max. You know, just once. It, it would be nice to see multi-millionaire movie stars get the shaft like the rest of us in the middle of a pandemic. But no, no. Warner Media is going to pay out the nose to keep talent happy, which is the most important thing in showbiz, of course. They're going to end up paying more in bonuses than they would have if these movies had opened in theaters. Like, if you thought that The Little Things was going to be a big hit because it has Denzel Washington in it, think again. Like, there was always a cap on that. So Jason Kylar, you know, he was trying to save money. Now he's going to end up spending even more of it. Uh, and meanwhile, I keep seeing all these people you know, not actors, celeb rappers and, and influencers and all these people just booking these jobs in Hollywood. It's like, does Hollywood doesn't want actors anymore. It just wants famous people. It's, it's just like politics. It's a mirror of politics. They don't want politicians anymore. They just want famous people who can win. Hollywood just wants famous people whose fans may tune in. It's not about the actual product anymore. These people fucking cannot act. Like what? Cardi B has scored her first leading role in a movie. It was cute when Cardi B was, you know, a, a stripper in Hustlers or whatever. Cardi B, set to star in Paramount's Assisted Living. Okay, described as a raucous comedy with tremendous heart. Seems like a good opportunity for the studio that needs hits. It's really funny. It's got heart. But we're going to cast Cardi B in. Why? Because she's a celebrity. It's in the vein of classics like Tootsie Sister Act and Mrs. Doubtfire. Cardi B is going to play a small-time crook who finds herself in over her head when a heist goes wrong. On the run from the cops and her former crew, she struggles to find anywhere to hide. Running out of options, she disguises herself as an elderly woman and hides out in the one place no one will look for her, her strange grandmother's nursing home. <coughs> I mean... Can you imagine writing this script and being having it compared to Tootsie Sister Act and Mrs. Doubtfire, okay? And then selling it and finding out it's going to star Cardi fucking B. Look at those movies that I compared it to or that, you know, Deadline or Hollywood Reporter's Source or whoever compared it to. Tootsie, starring Denzel, sorry, D starring Dustin Hoffman, one of the greatest actors ever. Mrs. Doubtfire, starring Robin Williams, Oscar winner. Sister Act, starring Whoopi Goldberg, Oscar winner. All these people are Oscar winners, okay? You can't just have Cardi fucking B come in and think you're going to get a movie on the level of Tootsie Sister Act or Mrs. Doubtfire. Like, no, what you're going to get is a piece of trash that opens maybe above average opening weekend and then is completely forgotten forever. Like, what the fuck? What the fuck? Apple has picked up Kitbag, the Ridley Scott, Joaquin Phoenix movie about Napoleon. Apple is carving out an interesting niche for itself in the marketplace. If you haven't noticed, like they're spending on Killers of the Flower Moon, on Emancipation, right? Leo, Will Smith. Now, Joaquin is not a Leo or a Will Smith level. Uh, you know, he's just not that kind of box office star. Like, you know, when he's playing Joker, that's one thing. That's the character. <laughs> Um, but I like what Apple's doing here. They're not going after, like, if they're going to spend a lot of money on a movie, it's not going to be, they haven't really done stuff like The Gray Man, where it's this big action thriller with Ryan Gosling and Chris Evans. They're going after movies that are sort of prestige projects. Like, Kit Bag could be an Oscar contender, just like Emancipation could, and Killers of the Flower, Flower Moon could. And I actually like that strategy, rather than just sort of turning out you know, commercial programmers or whatever. I mean, it's not that these movies aren't commercial um, because I think that all of them are, but, you know, obviously they're not designed for the, the, the idiot masses. Um, I saw this, uh, you know, earlier today. 
clicked on it by chance and, and then recognized the project they were talking about. Netflix and Matt Reeves had uh, picked up the Sarah Conrad Crowler script, uh, formerly known as Dead of Winter. It's a survival thriller. It's untitled right now. But I remember this project, Dead of Winter. I think it was either in the works at like a Lionsgate or an STX or something like that. It was going to star Haley Steinfeld, or at least that was the name I'd always heard. Uh, but it's like about a, a family on vacation in the mountains who have to fight for their survival when they're confronted by a dangerous criminal on the run. Um, that's a smart pl- pickup for Netflix. Like that is, again, that's the kind of stuff that Netflix picks up that Apple wouldn't. Netflix picks stuff like that up. And uh, ooh, what was the other one? I just had it and, and then it just, it just, it was there and then it went away. Um, Sweet Girl, the, the Jason Momoa movie. You know, it, it's these types, types of like, B-movie programmers, if you will, um, that, that, that floats Netflix's boat. And I mean, when you have to release a movie every week, like, yeah, you, you need a handful of those kinds of movies as well. But I like, Apple is definitely more choosy and I like their tastes, the way that they're picking and choosing stuff. Uh, real quickly, what is, what is the Oscar race right now, right? So there's a lot of talk about Judas and the Black Messiah this week because, you know, early reactions came out. Most people said it, it's like, great. I mean, if it's closer to The Departed than Black Mass, then you've got an Oscar contender. If it's more Black Mass than The Departed, you've got an HBO Max release. Uh, but like, to, you know, seeing the second trailer for that movie come out this week, I was just like, this looks like best picture to me. Because I, as much as I love Sound of Metal and Nomadland, I don't know that I really got best picture vibes off of them. I, I do think that Nomadland is the clear front runner for best picture, but it's like, okay, if, if it's not Nomadland or, or Judas, like, what are we talking about here? People are talking, you know, when you look at the critics groups and stuff like that, small acts, that's not even in the mix. That's an Emmy play. That's not even an Oscar play. First cow. That's a critics thing. That's not an, an Oscar play. Give me a break. Like, like what is the race? We've got Nomadland. Now Judas, maybe, which I, I, I wanted to watch last night, but I ended up watching Silk Road just because I read that book this summer and could not wait to see the movie. And then I guess One Night in Miami, is that like the sleeper? Is that, is that the dark horse? I thought One Night in Miami was really good. Um, you know, I guess that and, and Ma Rainey, like are, are those the two spoilers? Like do, do they end up splitting the vote? Especially with something like Defy Bloods out there or, or Minari? Like... I, I don't know. Is there enough room for all these, you know, normally there's like a one movie that's like the black movie or whatever, that's going to get the black vote and, and uh, you know, or the diversity vote, whether it's Moonlight Parasite, what, whatever it is like this year, frankly, most of the movies do feature black leads or diverse leads like Sound of Metal. Um, and I just, I, I wonder if those movies are going to have to split the vote, you know, or if they're just going to be sort of like, there's room for as many of these movies as we can get. Cause they're all good movies, you know, or, or do the, do the old white guys in the Academy rally behind nomad land? Like it, that seems like an odd movie to rally behind, uh, which is why I always thought Judas sort of had the upper hand because it's a, it's a fucking like a crime movie. Like people are comparing it to like Sidney Lumet. Um, and, and, and we miss that kind of stuff. I think it's been too long since we had a, a movie like the Departed or Argo win. And this is Warner Brothers as well. So they know how to, how to sell these, these kinds of movies to voters, even though the Academy has obviously greatly changed, perhaps in, in Judas's favor since those two movies won Best Picture. Uh, there was another story this week about like, you know, release date shuffles and everything like Basically, we're fucked. Right off the first six months of this year, if you think you're going to see a big movie come out in the, in, in the first six, six months of the year, you're wrong. Um, like James Bond, I, it's you know, I got tipped off one of my listeners. They said, oh, you know, I pay attention to all the Bond stuff. And here's this Dutch cinema owner saying he's gotten word that the movie's going to be pushed to the fall. We reach out to MGM. You know, they come back to me with, you know, the, the global release date remains April 2nd. You know what? Thanks, MGM. Thanks for fucking nothing. Like I, MGM, by the way, maybe at the top of the insider shit list as far as corporate communications goes. Like they're fucking useless. Uh, poof. Yeah. So James Bond is moving. Um, deadline came in the very next day, and like they they don't need the comment from MGM. That's the thing. 
They don't need the MGM comment. They can just say, you know what? We're hearing that they just cited the Dutch cinema owner and saying, well, we're also hearing from lights licensing partners, you know, uh, that, that, that this movie's being moved. The movie's fucking moved. Bond is not coming out in April. If you think Bond is coming out in, in two and a half months, <coughs> you're, you're just insane. Um, you know, Mo, uh, Morbius already moved from March to October, which is a better time for that movie anyways. But like all this, all this stuff, it's all, it's all moving. Moving or selling to a streaming service or push it to 2022. Because um, look, look at, the, look at how the vaccine is rolling out. Too fucking slow, if, if you ask me. Uh, trailers this week, we talked about the second Judas trailer, which was tr- tremendous. I mean, it was just a great, a great ad and totally different than the first movie too. Um, just love how they're selling it. Cherry, we got a, finally got a trailer for the Russo Brothers movie starring Tom Holland. Didn't love the trailer. I'm still excited for this movie. Uh, I thought the trailer could have been a bit better. It was a little bit all over the place. I Care A Lot, I think looks great. That's with Rosamund Pike playing just a, a terrible woman bilking old people out of their homes and fortunes. <coughs> Excuse me. We got a trailer for Breaking News in Yuba County, which looked weird and wild. It had Aquafina doing all kinds of weird shit. Uh, Wanda Sykes holding holding a gun at, at Aquafina's vagina, saying, "You know, I, I respect that area." Uh, Aquafina fingering Allison Janney's mouth. Just a, a weird looking indie, and I thought that was going to be like an Oscar contender, given the names involved and Tate Taylor and everything. That's clearly not the case. It just looks, a, it looks like a, a fun kind of comedic caper movie. Uh, we debuted the trailer for Al Davis versus the NFL, which is the latest 30 for 30 doc. I thought that looked pretty good. I really I think 30 for, for 30 has a great track record in my book. And Al Davis is, is, was always quite the character. So I'm, I do want to check that out. We also got a full on trailer for Clarice on CBS. Now, like, listen, I, you got to judge us on a scale. Okay, this is the first CBS show I even want to watch in like a decade. Um, I thought it looked good. It's not going to be fucking Silence of the Lambs. I'm not expecting a masterpiece here. I'm not even expecting a show on the level of Hannibal. But for CBS, I think you got to hand it to him. Like Clarice looks like uh, uh, something that could really take off and be a hit for them. Um, And Rebecca Breeds, you know, okay, she's not Jodie Foster, but she actually looks decent. As, as Clarice Starling, you know, those are big, big shoes to fill. If she can do better than Julianne Moore did in Hannibal, I'll be pleased. So that was kind of it, I think, for, for the week. I'm trying to think if I saw anything else. I, you know what I saw? I saw American Skin, um, which was good. I can see why, you know, it may have a 14% fresh rating on Rotten Tomatoes. I can see why the critics may not have liked it. But I think it'd be a real shame if we just took away the, ca- the, the the camera from from Nate Parker. Like, this is a filmmaker with something to say. And, and you may have your own personal feelings on Nate Parker, and, and I don't begrudge them, you know, if you do. But he probably made that movie on a really low budget. And, and I, I liked what it had to say. I liked the way it said it. I liked the cast. You know, I don't know if Nate Parker himself is the greatest actor. I, I think that may actually be his sort of secret Achilles heel is that he has a certain ceiling as a performer. Um, but he was fine. He, he, he was fine. And, uh, and I really like Shane Paul uh, McGee, who's also in um, the last shift. Uh, keep, keep an eye on him. He's, he's got some, he's got something. Uh, yeah. Was that it? Was that all that I saw? The Mauritanian that uh, lease embargo, the, sorry, the review embargo lifted. Good movie. Not great. Uh, you know, probably could have been a little bit better. Like, I think there was just like a lot, like the end, the movie ends and then there's just like all this text and it's like, well, where was all of that? I would have loved to have seen some of this stuff uh, that the text refers to at the very end. But, you know, when you put Jodie Foster and, and Shailene and, and Benedict Cumberbatch and, and mainly Taha Rahim, who is excellent, like Taha Rahim does not get the credit he deserves as an actor. Uh, you, you know, it's going to be tough to go, to go wrong. 
maybe it would have been made a better, you know, documentary or even like a docu-series or something. I don't know, but uh, it was an, an interesting story, the Mauritanian, and, and worth checking out. Like very competently made, well acted. Uh, I, th- I thought it was better than the re- the Amazon movie, The Report, uh, starring Adam Driver. It's you know in in, in the, that same kind of vein. Uh, yeah, that, that's it. That'll do it for the show. Thank you for watching the Snyder Cut. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram and Cameo at, at the In Snyder. You can find me on where else? I started a little trivia for money group, okay? On on Facebook. Search for either hit me up on Facebook or search for In Snyder Training Club, although I, I may have made the group private. I don't know. But I'm trying to get people, I want to run these games where it's like five players per game. And I ask the trivia questions and I get a little fee for writing the questions and everything. But really, it's just the, the five of you duking it out amongst yourselves in, in trivia from, from the mind of the In Snyder. Uh, we've got, what, the Schmodown Awards Friday night, tomorrow night. I'm looking forward to that. Free agent specials and drafts and all kinds of stuff coming up in the Schmodown. If, if that's how you found this podcast, if, if you watch me because of that, a lot of the exciting stuff coming up. Plus a match with, against Dan Merle. I got to start training for that. Got to flip the switch in my brain. Um, and then Sundance on the horizon. Sundance, I'm not very excited about it this year. Again, the, the lineup just doesn't do it for me. But uh, yeah, I just, I miss it. I can't wait to get back to Utah. Um, can't wait to get out of my house. I've been in quarantine for a week. I have not even left the top floor of my home. Uh, so I got a few more days to wait. Anyways, have a wonderful weekend. Stay safe. Keep washing the hands. Keep wearing your masks. And next week, we should have a new present. Take care, guys. Bye.